I must thank all our citizens and residents for tuning in to this press conference and for participating in another element of our good governance agenda. Our government offers several avenues for such participation in the life of our country. We do so, for example, to regular meetings of our parliament, which are carried live. In 2014, the parliament then met a mere three times, whereas in 2018 we sat for 13 times, four times more sitting in the ensuing period. Good governance is working in St. Kitts and Nevis, and more and good governance will come at our next sitting of the parliament when a number of pieces of legislation and that subject matter will be debated. Our weekly Working For You program, hosted by Director General of Government Information Services, Mr. Lesroy Williams, is now part of the national staple of information and accountability by my government. Town hall forums, which afford us the opportunity to regularly present to citizens and residents an account of our stewardship over the nation's affairs while giving the public the opportunity to question us on matters of importance to them. We could refer to the call-in programs in which callers speak directly to the Prime Minister and Ministers of Government. In this regard, I commend the Honourable Patrice Leibard for his own independent radio program, which is done twice per week. I also take note that the Honourable Mark Brantley hosts a weekly program on the island of Nevis. There is no dirt then, no scarcity of information regarding the affairs of the country, and those who pretend otherwise are just creating mischief. There is strong support for the judiciary by my administration, and we have consistently been lauded by judicial officials for our support. We have received support to strengthen our criminal justice system. We now have three sitting judges in our federation, rather than two, two in Bastyr, one in Charlestown. The matters are being dealt with more quickly by the system as a result. The assizes system as we once know it, I'm advised, is now brought to an end. And the High Court is literally on call to deal with criminal and civil matters five days a week. Indeed, interestingly, I'm advised that the court is calling sessions on Saturdays too, as required. Justice then in our country is being dispensed. With all of that, would you be surprised that St. Kitts and Nevis rank exceptionally well on matters of justice on the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index for 2017? And how do we rank? We rank number one in the OECS, the best performing country in the OECS. We rank 30 of over 100 plus countries in the world. And on several indicators, we were the best performing, not just in the region, but in the entire world. In the entire world. These are the facts which speaks eloquently to good governance. Good governance at the basic level is about accountability. The electorate being able to hold your account and everywhere we have been doing that. This press conference and the regularity of it is an indication of our commitment. Of course, there are those engaged in cherry picking. They want to dictate to the government what to be done and when to be done, as if their vote is bigger than the vote of the man in St. Paul's, or Sandy Point, or Tabernacle for that matter. The government has made commitments, and the government is carefully executing those commitments. There is no bigger boss than the people's <coughs> government, 
and the voice of God in these matters. We have also given support to all major stations, to ads and payments for government <coughs> programs, all in the interest of good governance. This press conference today is been taking place in the immediate aftermath of the most successful hosting of two international events, to wit, the Caribbean Invest Summit and the Music Festival. The fourth annual Caribbean Invest Summit was held in St. Kitts and Nevis over the period 20th and 21st of June. It attracted 415 delegates and speakers <coughs> coming from around the world and the feedback from them has been extremely positive about our country and people. The attendees came from Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia, all participating countries in CBI programs. They came too from the United States of America, from Canada, the United Kingdom. They came from Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Jordan, and we could go on and on. The world came to St. Kitts and Nevis. The world recognized that we have been offering them a unique product for the last 35 years. The world recognized that our citizenship by investment program, taught out then in the 1980s, to stalwarts like my good friend Richard Keynes and former Deputy Prime Minister, Ambassador Michael Powell. And the government then is still the oldest and the best program. So they came. They came not to conquer. They came to learn. And they learned much about our country. The participants have commented positively on the high quality presentations and panels and such topics as due diligence, which we consistently rank highly and among the best on. Marketing, the OECD and EU issues, local banking constraints. They discuss closer collaboration among key industry stakeholders as a major topic of interest while regulating the Caribbean citizenship by investment programs and codified professional standards for industry practitioners were readily discussed and agreed in principle. <coughs> Local developers were particularly enthused by the interest shown by visiting international marketing agents. These are the critical people who sell the products. The agents in turn were amazed at the high quality infrastructure on the islands and the progress being made on the major projects in the Federation. They spoke frequently about the progress at Galaxy's Ramada, at Nevis Hamilton Beach Resorts, at Tilloff by the Wyndham, and the Golden Rock Commercial Park, where one of our first local developers in Scott Keynes has been involved. The impact of the visit has been tremendous. Hotel rooms have been booked. And I am advised and verily believe that approximately 495 room nights were booked at our local hotels, with taxi men benefited from the transportation to and fro of these visitors to the major event venues. And taxis include the water taxi, of course, because they were frequent, well, several events hosted over at Nevis and visits there. The second major event that took us in international spotlight was, of course, the music festival. The 23rd edition of our St. Kitts Music Festival has been recorded in the minds of many and the annals of history as the most successful edition to date of our music festival. Let me congratulate Minister Lindsey Grant and his team, and in particular, Damien Hobson, the chairman of the Music Festival Committee, on an excellent job. Equally, I commend the Police High Command and our Defense Force, Forces 
for outstanding security arrangements made at the new venue. Three nights, I am advised by the chairman, do well over 25,000 attendees, and there was no major incident reported to the Commissioner of Police. The public and the patrons alike must therefore be commended for their cooperation with the police, for their civility and graciousness at the venues, and for preserving the peace and good order. We have taken our festival to a higher level, and arguably it is now the premier summer festival in the region. The hotels had a big boost in stay over arrivals you couldn't get in, no matter how hard you try. Car rentals agency were overbooked. The water taxi operators made good money, and every event, I am told, returned good, re good rewards. But there is more good news. I'm advised that over 50 local businesses employing 300 persons have benefited directly from this year's music festival. 50 local businesses employing 300 persons directly benefited from this festival. And further good news yet is that the music festival is ready to pay all vendors, everyone <coughs> whom they owe for services provided. And I've been asked by the chairman to indicate that they would wish to receive all bills by the 5th of July to facilitate full settlement soonest thereafter. So everybody will be paid. It means that they must have done very well. They are anxious to pay, which is a good thing. And hopefully some surplus will be reported back to the consolidated fund, <coughs> but we will see. I want to turn again to another area of good news. And it's amazing in the context of all the positive things that are happening, people find time for gossip and idleness and mischief rather than celebrating the successes of our people, our government, and our country. Count your blessings, count them one by one, and it will surprise you how many good things are happening in this, our beloved country. Turning to our fiscal and debt performance for the period, January to April 2019, for the fourth month in a row, and the fifth year in succession, the fiscal performance of our country continues on a strong and positive <coughs> part on the team unity. During the period 2010 to 2015, under the bygone regime, growth was negative in 2010, 2011, and 2012, according to the IMF report 14 stroke 1 to 8 if my memory serves me well. Prudent fiscal operations of the federal government have resulted in record surpluses and recurrent account, and overall account, and primary balance, the three most significant indicators used to assess government performance internationally. In the context of St. Kitts and Nevis, we are doing very well on each of them. Not one, but all three. The actual recurrent overall and primary balance far exceeded the budget to date. However, moreover, all fiscal balances were noticeably above the performance of the comparable period of 2018, respectively. Put another way, we were not only surpassing our budget for 29, but when we compare our actual receipts in 2019 to date, compared to 2018, we were outshining. We were outdoing ourselves, and this must be a good thing. Two areas of revenue elements which come to mind are corporation taxes and withholding taxes. So businesses are doing well and they are paying their taxes, which is a good thing. And if businesses are doing well, their employees then have jobs. And those jobs, on the face of it, 
would sustain into the future. Successful businesses know how to keep their employees happy and they invest into further success stories. The realization of a surplus is a function not only of the success at revenue collection, and I want to commend all our revenue collecting agencies, in particular the Comptroller of Indian Revenue, Edward Giff, for last year, they outdid the year before, and did very well, brought in, I think it was over a billion dollars in tax collected at the Inland Revenue Department. So when people say things not so good, somebody a lie. Things not so good, and yet so many persons are able to pay their taxes, and the country could have its highest record of revenue collection at Inland Revenue Department. So we know where the truth lies. The truth is always the proof is in the eating of the pudding. And in the collection, we understand the health of the economy. And there's a direct collection, correlation, between what the government collects and how the economy is doing. Because we are collecting it from businesses, from people, from those who bring in the cars and vehicles, and so on and so the like. The government expenditures were primarily to support personal emoluments, salaries, wages, allowances, pension and gratuities, goods and services, interest payments, transfers, and capital expenditure. I want to commend our accounting officers and the Ministry of Finance for containing recurrent expenditure to less than 1% departure from the budget. <laughs> And again, this raises the issue of credibility. We predicted what the expenditure will be for 2019 in December of 2018, and we are well on target. So we know what we are doing, and we are managing well. Our transfers were primarily to the University of the West Indies and other institutions of learning. Last night, I called to our Frida Wachester who is in charge of training and human resource. And she assured me we are up to date with our payments to UE and all other institutions for the academic year ending this summer. We also, of course, would pay and should be up to date with all international organizations, including United Nations, including CARICOM, where I will go later today for the meeting and all other such entities. And then, of course, our poverty alleviation program about which persons so regularly ask where the money will come from for this thing. That is going. And we have not missed one month of payment. Started in December, continued in January, continued in February, continued in March, continued in April, continued in May, continued in June, and we will pay in July and every month. Again, it was a first time initiative. So many persons, near 4,000 people, for the first time in the history of our country and in the history of the region, the government making payouts to needy people. We're giving them a top up, if you will, as some people call it, of $500. And they say, me, I can't believe y'all were going to do this for you. But we are holding true to our word and our commitment. Our capital build out has benefited our people who see and experience where the money is going as they watch and they drive and walk on our island main road every day. The feeling is good. They see the improvements in our housing projects all over the country. Our investment in the sidewalks everywhere, from Connery to Tabernacle. Improving the safety. And this is particularly important for the elderly person who doesn't have the time and the agility to move rapidly from ongoing traffic moving to and fro. 
This is particularly important for the young children who are going to schools, who sometimes are absent-minded in relation to the movements of the traffic. And when I, as the parliamentary representative, pass through large project, I notice how we have created this new sidewalk. I feel very good. I feel happier because the safety of the children who walk every day from Violet Petty School <laughs> down to Atlas and down to La Borio, that safety has been significantly enhanced. And what about the disabled with their wheelchair, who sometimes our people are too insensitive to and about? We have now, by creating those sidewalks, enhanced the quality of life and the lived experience for all. And I want to commend the engineers of Public Works and Minister Leibert for that thoughtfulness in the resurfacing of the island main road. I could speak through to our hurricane relief program that is benefiting over 2,000 people. Never happened yet. I could speak to the excitement now as you pass Old Road Bay and all can see what is shaping up to be a magnificent rehabilitated Old Road Bay stretch of land with improved safety and convenience for all. So you can see what your government is doing. The expenditures that are happening benefiting our people. And not just the government, but the wide public sector. The second coup spare by Casper, we know that that is over 60% complete. The re re rehabilitation work at our airport, RL Bachelor International, are taking place. Everywhere then, there is something more pleasing, aesthetically pleasing, about St. Kitts and Nevis. We have now been placed in a leadership position in so far as public infrastructure is concerned. Take a look at our ferry terminal, the best in the Caribbean. And one visitor from New York ventured to say it's like the best in the world. In there was so cool and nice, he said to me. Talk about our East Bus Terminal, the most beautiful one in the region. And it is certainly of international class. These very fine things are the products of our own. And we have to stand in solidarity and support of our local talents and our local people who are doing such a fine job. I move quickly to discuss the matter of debt management, a major legacy scar which we inherited from the bygone former regime was the explosive debt situation which sent us into the arms of the IMF for an extraordinary austerity program. St. Kitts and Nevis, under that discredited regime, chalk up a national debt which was the second worst in the world. The second worst in the world. We were like a failed state, a pariah state. That is the reality. And that is why when we came to office in February of 2015, we took the decision that we have to wipe off, as it were, this blight and the history of our independent nation. And I advised the Ministry of Finance to pay off the remaining debt to the IMF of $117 million. $117 million left behind. It was important to me and to our country that we send a signal that the era of squander mania and irresponsible management of the fiscal affairs would no more be part of the landscape of St. Kitts and Nevis. It was important that we send to the IMF and the international community that the new administration was confident of its ability to manage St. Kitts and Nevis and to do so successfully. 
it was important that we send a message that we understood the consequences of an austerity IMF program. It was important that we said goodbye to the pain of the haircuts that impacted our banks and our social security and our churches. It was important we said goodbye to that past. It was important, of course, that we say we understood how the homegrown program brought a stake, a pause, a halt to increments being paid three years in a row to our civil servants. You're living at the same level. It was important that we say that we understand that the 17% that imposed on our people, including their food, their medicine, and funeral expenses, those were abominations of a past maladministration. And so we quickly paid off that debt. But even having paid that off, we end up with surpluses. No wonder some people don't understand. No wonder some of them wonder whether this is voodoo economics. It is the hand of God in those kind of things. Paying substantially, sending a message of our own confidence in the future, and sending it loud and clear. I'm pleased to report that as at the end of March 2019, I am advised that our debt to GDP ratio has reached a new low of 56.4%. Recall that December 2018, we were the first independent country in the OECS to have brought our debt to GDP ratio in conformity with the international standard of 60%. We were then about 58%. So the reduction continues, meaning we are better at managing the affairs of the country. It is a high honor for me to report that our fiscal situation on a per capita basis is the best in the region. It is the past bad inheritances of the former administration that have imperiled the sustainable development of our country. And our government is trying hard to extricate itself from these inheritances without stagnating our country's growth and our people's progress. Yes, before team unity, the fiscal management was problematic. I feel for the civil servants forced out with a new term called attrition at 55. I still feel for the businesses that had to close because they could not sustain the significant 85% increase. And the Minister of Public Infrastructure is coming to Cabinet with a new program to bring significant relief to the elderly in terms of their electricity. I still feel the hurt of the non-establishment workers, over 1,200 of them who as part of the IMF homegrown program, as the advisors to call it. Their holiday pay of 2.5% of their annual wages came to an end. Abruptly so, and they had no say. So, so many people have suffered from poor management of the economy. No wonder we had a fresh start with the Team Unity Administration. I want to point to a special reduction of about 30 plus percent in land prices. And for this particular initiative, the Cabinet has taken a decision to, as it were, encourage real property ownership by our people. And as a consequence, we have determined that we will reduce the prices for commercial and industrial lands in these 12 locations across the country. 12 locations. The price really is now somewhere around $10. In fact, there's a range. Some got at 7 some got at 10 And our initiative will be to reduce it from 10 to 450 
from 7 to 450 a significant drop of over 50 percent in some cases which locations are affected canada industrial estate just outside of connery cunningham industrial estate kaon commercial and institutional development this means that area there by Zumi Mechanic and all of these people now, they have a 50% nigh reduction in the land price and an opportunity to move from the leasehold ownership to real ownership of property in their own country. So they can come very quickly. In fact, we are giving them 12 months with this special offer. Go to the bank, go to your credit union, go to your friend, go to Richard Keynes even. Get the money, but pay him back. Whoever you go to, you must pay back. Get the money, buy your land, own the land. You're free to use that as collateral to get other things that you may need for your business. Canada Industrial, Cunningham Industrial Estate, Kayon Commercial, Lemon Hill Commercial and Industrial, this is above large, Tabernacle Commercial and Industrial, next to the cemetery in Tabernacle, Shadwell Industrial Estate, Pine Garden Commercial, St. Peter's Commercial and Institutional, St. Paul's Commercial, High Point Commercial and Institutional, Farms Industrial, New Guinea Industrial. This is a significant effort by the government to empower people, to give you a chance at ownership. This is history making because before our time, lands were in the possession of a privileged few. The nationalization of the land was an effort to empower local people. It never happened the way we would have liked because the Attorney General will say it was acquired without proper compensation being paid. And then the compensation was being paid during the 80s, I think it was, by the Paminapi administration, which then made it possible for people to add. The legacy of disenfranchisement of land in St. Kitts had never been parallel in Nevis. Nevis people always have lands and these big parcel of lands, Premier Amri, and those people would have <laughs> in St. Kitts because of the sugar and the high demand on our lands. We always got a smaller piece of land. But few people had moved to ownership. They had occupancy of the land. They never appreciated the need to go the next step. And so special measures over time have had to be done. In this particular case, we are trying, as it were, to decentralize economic activity all around St. Kitts and Nevis. So you don't have to come to Basti or close to Basti for everything. So Tabernacle can have something going there. Kayard, Sandy Point, and so on, St. Peter's. <laughs> this is an important program. The other program I will touch on quickly, and I made reference to it, is our poverty alleviation program. Suffice it to say that to date, we have paid out $13.6 million to beneficiaries under that program. And to serve notice that the next payment for this well-received program will be on Wednesday, July 24, 2019. For June, 3,372 beneficiaries receive direct deposits to their bank accounts. Those were persons who had submitted their bank accounts after the first initial payment in December. And 556 received by checks. Some people have determined they want it in their hand. They don't want to send the money to the bank for them or they are suspicious about giving their account, so they prefer to come and collect theirs, which is their right. But we really want to move to a cashless society, so we have to do more in terms of public education. So that would have brought that to over 3,900 plus beneficiaries in June. 
at least who have actually received, there's still some who at the time of this reporting had not yet gone to collect. I want to commend the officers of the government, Mrs. Gail Phillip, the Senior Director of Statistics in the Ministry of Sustainable Development and her team, Permanent Secretary Janet Lewis in the Ministry of Social Development and Gender Affairs, Mr. Bracho, our Accountant General and his team, for this spectacular effort in implementing a new program positively, positively impacting the lives of nearly 4,000 persons on the island of St. Kitts and on the island of Nevis. Payments are being made on both islands. And this has been going on without any major glitch. I think it is commendable to the professionalism and dedication of our people. And there have been some good snippets where reports have come in that persons who at the time were under 3,000 and started getting and then they got a promotion or another member got a job of the family got a job they went and they reported to Mrs. Philip that they no longer qualify. I wish that more persons were like that because we have had some reports of some who do not qualify and we are committed to do the necessary investigations to rectify the situation. So there is some good news about the virtues of our people which we want to commend and celebrate. I should bring to the public attention that we will be honored to receive Her Excellency the President of the Republic of China this month from the 13th to the 16th of July. The visiting presidential party of over 100 plus persons will spend about four days here and three nights in St. Kitts and Nevis. I gather that we are the first destination on her Caribbean trip and that she will spend more time in our beautiful twin island paradise than in any other allied state. So we welcome them and that large delegation if they are persuaded, they can even double up the numbers because we have room. This though is a sure sign of the importance which the Republic of China, Taiwan, attaches to the diplomatic relations which St. Kitts and Nevis established way back then in 1983 and before that in 1981 with the agricultural mission. That is when Mr. Powell attempted to plant some rice and they never go. <laughs> so, we have a long history. Quickly, as we speak about diplomacy, I want to inform that we have added to the responsibilities of a number of our ambassadors abroad. We have now, what you will describe, have given them multiple accreditation, which mean they are serving more than one country. So, Mrs. Sherry Truss, who is our High Commissioner to Canada, has also been approved by the government to serve as non-resident ambassador to Mexico while serving, continuing to serve as our High Commissioner to Canada. That then gives us a focal point to engage the government of Mexico on matters of bilateral concern and interest. And this then should help in our being able to have better cooperation and support from that government. Her Excellency Verna Mills, who is our ambassador to Cuba, has been um, put forward by our government to serve also in the capacity as ambassador to Ghana and South Africa. We're attempting then to improve our footprint in the African continent and Ms. Verna Mills, who is in Havana, will take on those responsibilities. Importantly, both Ghana and South Africa have also their high commissions, their embassies in, in Cuba. And so the cooperation and communication would be made easy. I want to personally wish each of these career public servants 
Miss Sherry Truss and Mrs. Verna Mills, <coughs> all the best in their new assignments and with their increased workload. The final matter I wish to reflect upon is the new period of calm in our country. Our country has benefited immensely from a significant period of calm and reprieve from gang-related violence, particularly homicides, since the outbreak in February of 2019. Indeed, major crimes in our beloved country are reported to have fallen by 28% as at the end of June 2019, compared to the comparative period of 2018. We give God thanks for this, and we commend the police for their work. In that regard, I want to commend Commissioner Brandy, um, because I think since October, the country had been doing relatively much better in the suppression of major crimes. And we had October, November, December, almost January, I think it was one. And then in February, we had the outrageous situation of some six or seven homicides in one month. Since that period of time, better sense is prevailing. The police have learned and the defense forces have learned and we are now witnessing over the last several months a significant reduction in these major crimes. It is our wish really that very soon our country would return to the halcyon days when gun-related and gang-related homicides were not present. I could well remember not so long ago that you hardly had a murder in some years. Hardly had what? Those were not things that would easily happen. Perhaps those were the days when people fought solely with their hands, perhaps with a matchet, perhaps with a knife. But gun-related homicides had not always been part of our day of life. It is true to say that this phenomenon of gang viol violence took life over the 20-year period preceding Team Unity. And in fact, it reached a crescendo, an unprecedented high of some 35 or 36 homicides in 2011. My government continues to hold the view that one homicide in our country is one too many. And so although we have witnessed a significant reduction in major crimes, and although I am advised that we have had over the last six months perhaps a 28% reduction in homicide, Mr. Brandy, we still are not satisfied that we are where we should be. Because one homicide is one too many. And I want at this particular moment to commend the efforts of several patriotic members of our society who have committed to work with the gangs and vulnerable groups to bring a positive change in their attitude to life and living. Values are being inculcated which include nurturing respect or greater respect for human life and humanity obedience to the commandment thou shall not kill and an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. My cabinet commends those efforts involving pastors, psychologists, counselors, businessmen, professionals and parents for this initiative to find alternative pathways for our people and to encourage them away from the senseless reprisal killings to working and living peacefully together. These peace initiatives now in vogue, I'm advised are calculated efforts by at-risk and vulnerable groups 
including what some refer to as gangs, to demonstrate in a very public way their interest in a new way of living. The peace is real, they tell us. Every initiative, I want to make this abundantly clear, every initiative to help keep our country safe by any entity will be and is welcomed by mad administration as a positive move. Peace will always be preferred to war, and peace in the minds of men is a precondition for a safer, safer and more secure St. Kitts and Nevis. When we look at it, things reach a crescendo. Things really got out of hand in 2011 with 35 homicides. And since that time, we have not really gotten it to a manageable level. Too many lives have been lost to guns and gang-related interventions. Too many have been left grieving and mourning. Too many young lives have been snatched away, gone too soon, before we could save them. We must now try everything to save and redeem as many as we can. And that is why we have been supportive of efforts whether it is of the church, or the business community, or a charitable group, or just an interested passerby, to do something to assist with the safety of St. Kitts and Nevis, we have always encouraged those efforts. Our government has been approached by this outreach team of patriots with some concrete measures which the team considers could help preserve the peace and law and order in our federation. These measures we believe and we advise would help us to build a more cohesive and inclusive society where all are endeavoring, all are contributing, and all are achieving in St. Kitts and Nevis. Several of the recommendations seem so sensible you wonder why they had not been thought of or implemented before. And several of them conform with our government's commitment to finding and implementing lasting solutions for safety, security, and the stability of our beautiful nation. In doing so, we will continue to engage at risk and vulnerable youths and adults providing them with opportunities for positive socioeconomic development while always, and I must repeat, always adhering to the rule of law. So we will never compromise on law. That is what we have been doing when we formed the Explorer Groups in Molyneux and Phillips, in Lodge Project, we went to Kayon, then we went to St. Paul's. Then Jean invited us up to St. Peter's. Then we were invited in Old Road, going through the length and breadth of the country. And we are attempting to get viable groups in Nevis, trying as it were to protect the young people from engagement in gang culture, helping them to say no to guns, no to hatred, not to anger, yes, that they can be the change which the society requires. That is what it is about. When we invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in their uniform, when we go as we did last week to do a groundbreaking ceremony, to invest $2.5 million to give them a home for training, for the community policing, it is an investment in the peace of the land. And we will continue those initiatives. But when those children leave their camps, they can't go home to broken families. They can't go back home to see a mother hiding the gun in her yard or under the bed. 
They can't go back home to witness abuse in the family. So more interventions are required. As we protect the young, we also give support to their families. And these are what these initiatives are about. Some who are their families are in gangs, quote unquote. We have to reach them. We have to engage them. And the government is committed to do that. And so we are about security of the country. That is why we continue our investment in teens and police support programs in our primary and high schools. That is why we brought the Canadian in Dr. Triton here to help work with our primary schools. And yesterday we had the very good experience, the senior minister and educator, the Honorable Lindsey Grant, he even told me to tell them as a good gesture that for next music festival, all 700 of them will receive a free pass. And they were excited about that. They felt incentivized. So we are doing those kind of investment. Triton was there preparing them to make the adjustment from grade six in primary to secondary school because we want to minimize the dropout early in their secondary education experience. If they drop out too soon, we know where they will go. Not in the cane fields, because those were closed in 2005. They are likely to fall vulnerable prey to gang life. And so we are attempting to track them. That is why we are doing programs of recidivism in our prisons to ensure that when persons would have paid the time for their crime, they can find work. We are giving them skills. They are now passing more CXCs than I had passed in my day way back then. And I want to commend the work of Mr. Nital, who has been one of the lead people in providing educational support to the inmates at Her Majesty's prison and to commend all others because this is how we will change society. But equally, we need buy it from all. We have to get the private sector on board, willing when the inmate would have been released to give he or she a job so that he now has an alternative pathway. Because if you constrain him, where will he go? to preserve his dignity as a man or woman. Where will he go? And so this program of support of outreach is not just for the government alone. It's not just for the team of patriotic people who are giving of their time, opening themselves to risk by reaching out to these quote unquote gang leaders, encouraging them to a better way. That is why the government has a $30 million CDB TechVoc program to enhance the skills of our people. But certainly, if they were to get a job at any private sector place, we don't want the persons out there. As soon as you see him or her, say, Lord, they got a criminal in here. Because you know what that can do. Today, being able to sustain a legitimate job what this government will do, working with others, is to provide opportunities for vulnerable group, including so-called members of gang, to have an improved opportunity to participate constructively in the socio-economic life of the country. And so, if they want to get involved in agriculture, and some have indicated that, the Honorable Eugene Hamilton is ready with lands to give them. And I've said to him, go even further, because they are vulnerable. Help them with the plowing of the land. Help them with the fencing of the land. And help them with whatever deterrence you have to deal with the monkey, so that they can make at least, or have a reasonable chance of success in agriculture. We are prepared to do that. 
The patriotic team have said to us, well, what if they want to do business? Because these people are very smart. These people understand the reality of life on the ground. How you are going to help them to live if they were to give up their life of illegal activities and illegitimate activities? And we say, well, the government has spoken. The government support small people, medium people, big people in the society with concessions and other forms of reliefs. We are prepared to develop programs that would allow them to get financial support for entrepreneurial pursuits, self-employment, and all these other things. You know, the truth is our country is so very small, too small for us to begin to exclude people. We don't have enough people to begin to do that. A small nation must utilize all of the resources that it has. This small country must be more forgiving. That is a powerful word from the Bible. The attitude of forgiveness, the healing process must come. And all of us, I believe, must respond to the new dynamics. You see, if there was a silver bullet, and I'm going to end there, in relation to crime, it would never have gone to 35 homicides. If there was a silver bullet, when we took over in 2015, 10 homicides, including one on election day, would not have um, preceded us in office. At the rate we were going, at the beginning of 2015, by extrapolation, we'd have had 60 homicides in the country. There's no silver bullets. No silver bullets. So every idea that seems sensible should at least, within the resources of the country, be given an opportunity. And we give people second chances. Indeed, some of us have had so many chances. We have to now think about multiple chances. Multiple chances. That maybe that is in part a message that the Minister of Ecclesiastical Affairs will have to get his church to preach more. Because some way if I got it wrong, but my recollection is that it was asked, how many times must I forgive them? You remember that, senior minister? Yes, sir. Is it somewhere in the Bible? How many times must you forgive them? Those who you think are inferior, those who you think are criminals, those of you think have no right to existence, and that's not your judgment call. We must forgive them as often as the grace of God lives within us. That is what we are called to do. But I want to make it absolutely clear in all we are doing, this government will never compromise our integrity, our dignity, nor the power of the state to act swiftly and decisively to dismantle every agency of disorder and insurgency on the land. And we will work hard to eliminate threats to national security. The pertinent ministries where it is necessary and practical will implement programs in a coordinated way with other agencies of the state, the private sector, the NGO, and the religious communities. And we will, importantly, insulate where and when necessary our law enforcement officers from any decision or commitment to any group, vulnerable or otherwise. In other words, the law enforcement officers, in particular, the police and defense force, must always be free to enforce the law, and they must do it without fear or favor. We said, yes, we will support you in a better part, because the damage to our country's reputation, the damage to our tourism product, the damage to the business environment when businesses have to close early because people are fearful, all those add up to a significant cost. 
And if we can find more instrumental program to achieve peace, we will do so. Team Unity aims to make St. Kitts and Nevis the best place to live, to work, to study, and do business. By God's grace, we will. But I promise we will never show up from doing what is right for the people of our country. We, we are on the part of peace. And everyone who want to partner with us will outstretch our hand. And every citizen and resident who we can save from a continuing life of crime, we will invite to come partner with us. And we invite the rest of the country to come be part of that wholesome partnership to make St. Kitts and Nevis the safest place to live. It is amazing though, you know, that those who could not control crime, those who said it was like water on their back when people talk about crime, seem to have a problem with the newfound peace in the land. It is as if the opposition would prefer that every night they wake up they hear someone get shot again. It is as if the Labour Party wants to see mayhem in the country. So rather than commend whoever they are are intervening, whoever they are are helping, including our police, to bring this new space and period and season of peace dividend. The Labour Party seem to have something stuck in the crack because they want murder in the land. It will not happen in St. Kitts and Nevis. We will use all the resources we can to bring people to a better way and a more peaceful way. So thank you very much for listening and agreeing with our objectives and goal to make our country the finest one ever.